Hey guys, it's Kaneko. Welcome back to my channel. Today I will be talking about hybristophilia, what it is, my opinions, and finding out what you guys think. But first, before we get into the video, I want to talk about my new setup. It was planned by my editor, Amandine, and of course Sam. I've got this great ass little fireplace and this new chair, and now we have angles and a cat cam. So you guys get a lot more attention and different angles and vibes. I'd also like to talk about the hair because that seems to come up a lot in the comments. And most of you are so nice and I love it. Like I love all the nice comments that you put down. Like they really do help and they make me feel good. But of course there are a couple that, you know, talk about the brass and the, the state of the hair. I am more than aware of brassiness because my hair is naturally black. So to bring it down to a level 9 to 10 blonde, there is going to be some red undertones and therefore, you know, brass. But I do get it toned every two weeks and hopefully you can just catch me on those weeks because otherwise it hurts my eyes as much as it hurts yours. But I'm living my blonde life and I want to continue. You take it or leave it, but I'm really enjoying it, okay? Let's dive into this. What is hybristophilia? This actually popped up in my comments and I was like, why didn't I think of this? Like, it is such a fantastic idea. Oh, before I get into this, I've broken some nails. So no ASMR today, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, so as I was saying, in my comments, someone mentioned hybristophilia and how it, like, what are my thoughts on it? And I thought that was really, really interesting because not only do I want to explore it from the viewpoint of someone with ASPD or a cluster B disorder, but more so also by being an author and working on books about serial killers and all of that sort of stuff. So before I go into it, let me just define what it is. So hybristophilia is in fact a paraphilia. It's more a fetish than say a sexual orientation, like being bisexual, or heterosexual that kind of stuff. It's more more like a kink. And, you know, I'm not one for kink shaming publicly. Like, just you do what you want to do as long as you're not hurting people without consent, right? Like, I'm not trying to ruin anyone's bedroom fun, as some people like to put it. <laughs> <laughs> but hybristophilia is the paraphilia that describes the attraction of certain people to other people who have committed violent crimes and also the sexual arousal of a person at the thought of the particular violent crimes themselves. I know that's a, like the word is a lot to take in and there are so many different perspectives that we need to hear because you don't really see it being talked about openly and I understand that because usually it's not very palatable to have hybristophilia. So I'm sure you guys have read the articles that came out after I published Honey Trap. There were so many people who were calling me a fetishist of people of violent crimes and enjoying the hurt and whatnot of the victims of those violent crimes. And this could not be further from the truth. So to give you a little bit more context, when I started writing the book Honey Trap, which of course centers on Ted Bundy and a female serial killer who work in tandem. When I started work on that, I was going through every avenue and every source to make it as historically accurate as possible and to portray it as it was at the time. Because while my segment that I added into it was fiction, the rest was facts. They all happen, the timeline is spot on. And I put a lot of effort into ensuring that. And the way I did this was contacting family members, contacting the police who worked on the case, going and scoping out the actual areas that were the center of these crimes. The biggest one was joining Facebook groups and other groups online that talked about the very small details of Ted Bundy's life. And it was in these groups that I saw this bizarre attraction and obsession for Ted Bundy himself. Every generation has used the best looking actor of the time to portray Ted Bundy. Now this seems like a very strange ploy because if you're not trying to romanticize him, why are you getting someone like Zac Efron to portray him, Mark Harmon, all of these other people who are considered extremely attractive? Surely there's some sort of grooming going on there where you are told to believe that this man is attractive and charismatic. There are actual people who've gotten tattoos of his bite mark on one of his victim's butt cheeks, right? It was 
quite disturbing to see people relive and enjoy this horror that was put upon so many young women and their families. In particular, the bite mark, because that was the evidence that clinched his conviction in Florida. Currently, he would not have gone convicted on that alone, because that's been kind of thrown out by courts now. It's not a reliable source of guilt anymore. Ted Bundy had so many groupies, like I don't know how to even go into that. He was getting 200 letters a day. In his trial, he would dress up real nice, he'll be showboating, because there were tons and tons of girls and young women who were in the audience of these trials and the ones who were watching at home. So he'd be showboating, he'd be like turning around, flirting with them, you know, and they would be lapping it all up. They actually had their hair parted in the middle and long, which of course was the style at the time, but that was particularly what Ted Bundy sought out in a victim. They fantasized about being the victim of these crimes that he's committed. When they were interviewed, it was quite clear that they were terrified of him but still had this weird fascination and love for him. And this is not something that is specific to Ted Bundy. You can see this in so many cases, including Jeffrey Dahmer, Richard Ramirez, even Richard Kuklinski, the Iceman, Chris Watts, Joseph Fritzl, Ariel Castro. Like these are not good people. Most of them are not attractive. When you're talking about conventionally attractive, surely Ted Bundy fits into that category. So does Richard Ramirez and Jeffrey Dahmer. But the rest of them, you can't explain it away on attraction alone. Another big example of this was Charles Manson. He had the power of manipulation and control to get people to actually kill for him. Imagine having the power to actually get people to murder for you. I just want to clarify for that matter that I was in these groups to glean information to make my book as accurate as possible. I do not have a crush on Ted Bundy. I do not have any sexual attraction to him. I'm not in love with him. I don't think he was innocent and I do think he deserved the death penalty. Being in those groups and being accused of having high bristophilia, not that I'm judging, but being accused of it is just really off base and it's not true whatsoever. Also, people have asked what I think about this and to be fair, I actually have thought about it a lot. I've just never thought about putting it on my YouTube. I think that it's not necessarily just the crimes themselves because from what I've experienced these fangirls these groupies these people in in these chats like explaining their love for these people it doesn't just relate to that act of killing somebody even though that's more the definition of what this is I think it links back to charisma and the charm aspect of ASPD is something that I believe really pulls these people in. And let me just explain. Ted Bundy, he was incredibly charismatic and without a doubt in the world, he had ASPD. He was diagnosed with it. He was also diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And again, I am not a mental health professional. So I'm not out here giving diagnoses. I'm just sharing my opinion. To get into numbers, 40% of the prison population is comprised of people with ASPD. Each killer and sex offender I've mentioned here has been diagnosed with ASPD. People tend to be quite attracted to people with ASPD. And it's not just the charm and charisma, as I mentioned. There's this confidence that is portrayed with most sociopaths. Sociopaths are social chameleons. So they also fit into any situation and make the most of it, which we can see here with all of these killers and creating trust between them and their victims. But people find that really sexy, the fact that they're not held back by remorse or guilt or a conscience. They don't understand that because I guess, like, I mean, I don't understand empathy to the point where a neurotypical does. Like, I mean, I can cognitively think about it, but I'm not going to feel what somebody else feels. It's just never happened for me. So that doesn't, that's not a factor in what I, like, in my decisions, right? It's not empathy that's leading me. And that's something that is attractive to a lot of people. I'm not saying for me. I'm just saying that all of these people I mentioned had that impulsivity, had that complete control of themselves of committing these acts and sticking by them you know you need to be accountable you need to be responsible for your actions and understand why they may hurt or inflict pain on others and a good example of that is 
what happened to Shanann Watts' family after Chris Watts annihilated his entire family. I was just shocked to see that people who were fans of Chris Watts, fans, yeah, fans, I don't know how many times I can say that, but people actually wrote to the family of Shanann Watts, who was brutally murdered alongside her two little girls, that she deserved it, that she pushed him to the edge. Like, where do you get off saying that to other people? It just makes no sense to me whatsoever. Something that's held in common between paraphilias and personality disorders is the ability to choose. I can choose to not act on my natural impulses. I choose not to do them. I choose to not hurt people anymore because I've seen the repercussions of what I've done to other people previously. And of course, I'm not capable of remorse at all, but I know that it was negative behavior and it shouldn't be repeated because it's just unnecessary chaos. I think that kind of leans into this paraphilia. You can choose not to act on it. You can choose to not attack somebody's family after the victim's been brutally murdered. That's a choice and choice really is important here because your paraphilia, your personality disorder, it doesn't define you. Your actions define you and you must be held accountable for what you are doing. Now that we've kind of discussed what it is, some examples, some behaviors associated with it, we need to think about what's caused this. Now with antisocial personality, this can be a result of nature or nurture or both. And this is very similar for hybristophilia. Usual people who experience paraphilia do have very low self-esteem. And it's said that they have abandonment issues and also issues with a fatherless home. And I'm not trying to make comments on that. That is literally what has been studied and found out about this particular paraphilia. I think this goes into the territory of some cluster B disorders, especially the abandonment and the need to nurture and help fix somebody. You cannot fix Richard Ramirez. You cannot fix any of these people because they don't want to be fixed. That's the problem here. And we need to understand that and step away. It does occur more in women than in men. It is something that is becoming increasingly more popular. I've seen some really shocking pages about the victims of Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris, the Combine shooters, and I've seen Tumblr fan pages of what they've done. And they're like, oh, he's so misunderstood. I just wish I was there to take care of him. But he didn't want to be taken care of. He wiped out so many people's children. You should think about that too. The last deciding factor happens to be the spotlight. A lot of these people who do end up in relationships with these convicted killers and rapists, etc., they want a bit of spotlight and profit and no better example for this than Nicole Kessinger. Nicole was Googling how much Amber was making off a book deal with her relationship with this killer. Getting your fame at the expense of people who are brutally killed, it seems kind of stupid if I may say so myself, I just think that's ridiculous. There's also the fact that people think this will prevent them from getting killed if this killer gets out. And again, that's patently false because there have been relationships where the killer and the pen pal have met up and they've become the victim as expected because some people just don't change. So I'm gonna wrap up here. I obviously do have a lot of opinions about this. And again, I don't wanna be shaming anybody, but I just do feel like we need to discuss the reasons behind this attraction and what we can do to foster a better relationship between people and their partners. I honestly don't understand why this is a female thing. I honestly would love to know what you guys think. I mean, this is such an interesting topic and I know I'm not a like mental health professional, but I just feel like this is something that we need to discuss and I think it links back quite strongly to ASPD. Thank you for watching and please make sure you like and subscribe because I'm here regularly for you now that my video editor lives with me and, and, and kicks me every time Gee! I decide not to post something. <laughs> That's me. All right, see you guys soon.